first, let me thank our sponsors. We have uh, the Department of Comparative Literature, the Department of English, um, and the Program in Creative Writing, and especially for getting us the space. Um, Middle East South Asian Studies, and the UC Davis Arboretum. As you all probably saw in the earlier flyer, we were meant to be outside on the, the wide deck, uh, but the high probability of rain this afternoon. Uh, of course, that's in the um, All right, so I'll begin by introducing our event with a passage from the editorial forward um, to Middle East Report's spring 2013 issue entitled Iraq 10, 10 years later. Um, of course, it's 11 years later now, almost exactly. March 20th marks the anniversary, March 20th. Um, of the, the second American invasion of Iraq, um, and, and much of what is said below is relevant, so I quote. The Iraq War is poised to disappear from American popular consciousness once the present flurry of retrospectives has blown over. President Barack Obama took the lid off the memory hole with his injunction to, quote, look forward, not backward. No official from the administration of George W. Bush has paid the smallest price, not for dispatching U.S. soldiers to their deaths for nothing, not for squandering billions of taxpayer dollars, not for terrifying the public into supporting the war with ghost stories about mushroom clouds and unmanned aerial vehicles spreading anthrax, and not for dealing a shattering blow to Iraq itself. The untold hundreds of thousands killed, the millions uprooted from their homes, the thousands tortured by the U.S. or its Iraqi vassals, the enshrinement of sectarian logic in the institutions of the Iraqi state. Almost without exceptions, the rush of tenure reflections ignore that the war happened mostly for Iraqis and that millions of them live with its trauma still. The war's violence persists, and war-driven sectarianism affects not only Iraq, but also the greater Middle most of the displaced are unable to return. And then there's the haunting environmental damage. The US military dropped an unknown number of depleted uranium and other toxic munitions upon Fallujah and elsewhere, leading to cancer clusters and an epidemic of birth defects. For Iraqis, the war is hardly over. And our poetry event commemorates the terrible sectarian bombing of Elm Denevi Street on March 5th 2007, a once thriving intellectual, literary, and art artistic hub of activity, replete with bookstores and cafes serving the vibrant Iraqi intellectual community. The street was named after the great 10th century Abbasid poet, al Nabi. As if that bombing weren't enough, the current al Maliki government bulldozed without warning al Mutanebi Street's historic book market the night of September 17, 2012 citing purported code violations obstructing ongoing neoliberal city unification <coughs> projects. A popular saying across the Arab world holds that Egyptians write, Lebanese publish, and Iraqis read. <laughs> and yet, across Iraq's tumultuous modern history, many Iraqis wrote and published prolifically as well, despite formidable obstacles. The state restrictions of the U.S. supported Saddam Hussein regime in the 80s and its imperatives, among others, to write anti-Iranian war propaganda during the decade-long Iran-Iraq war, the crippling UN economic sanctions in the 1990s, and life under active military occupation beginning in 2003. In fact, Baghdad was considered from the 1950s onward the center of literary and artistic modernism in the Arab world, nurturing the first widely acclaimed free verse poets, Nazika Manetka and Bedouk Shekhar Sayyab, both of whom will be read this evening, who broke away from the rigidly defined metrical systems in Arabic poetry in place since the 6th century CE. Arabic literature scholar Mara Naamam has written that the elegized lyrical Iraqi landscape present in the early free verse poets like Sayyab, replete with images of palm trees, seashells, and the flowing Euphrates, was wrenched into a, quote, critically delineated, unmusical warscape of violence and cynicism in more recent poetry, aggravating the mere battlefield that Iraq has become. Thus, the war is an object of poetry, however chaotic and unrepresentable it may be, has necessarily branded itself onto the literary imagination of nearly all Iraqi poets now living in or outside the country. Accordingly, our reading, while at the same time offering a limited representative sampling of modern Iraqi poets, will emphasize critical responses to the onslaught of advanced military barbarism and its manufactured desert storms. This evening,
event is a commemoration, but it is not an attempt at healing across the imperial divide. Following playwright Hassan Abdul Razak, Amutanebi Street stands as a metaphor for the suppression of thought and culture which can happen anywhere. It is therefore an attempt, from poetry's privileged standpoint, vis-a-vis -vis the social totality, which includes war's messy simultaneity and the, and the economic logic which undergirds it, to provide both a glimpse of the really existing in all its overarching ugliness and of that which could be otherwise. Put differently, poetry has a unique faculty for reminding us, in the tragicomic words of Bay Area performance artist Jeremiah Jenkins, that, quote, shit doesn't have to be so fucked up. <laughs> Artworks, wrote Theodore Adorno, are the stars of history. And as Dunya Mikhail comments in a recent NPR interview, rather than healing wounds, quote, poetry keeps them open forever. Poems are like x-rays, she says. They make you see the wound and understand it. Thank you once again for coming. I will turn it over to our first set of readers.
patches, ambulances, to various places, swings, corpses through the air, rolls stretchers to the wounded, summons rain from the eyes of others, digs into the earth, dislodging many things from under the ruins. Some are lifeless and glistening, others are pale and still, throbbing. It produces the most questions in the minds of children, entertains the gods by shooting fireworks and missiles into the sky, sows mines in the fields and reaps punctures and blisters, urges families to emigrate, stands beside the clergymen as they curse the devil, poor devil, he remains with one hand in the searing fire. The war continues working day and night. It inspires tyrants to deliver long speeches, awards medals to generals and thieves to poets. It contributes to the industry of artificial limbs, provides food for flies, adds pages to history books, achieves equality between killer and kill, teaches lovers to write letters, accustoms young women to waiting, fills the newspapers with articles and pictures, builds new houses for the orphans, invigorates the coffin makers, gives grave diggers a pat on the back, and paints a smile on the leader's face. It works with unparalleled diligence, yet no one gives it a word.